What's happening, weirdos? This is an incredible and very, very special episode. Very special, like Family Matters, one that have like a special one. But it is. This is James Finley, uh, who's an incredible, I'm going to say it, he's like a mystic. It, it, I feel like Katie and I, we drove uh, towards the beach in California here, and we went up into his house, and we sat with, uh, at first I was like, this is like a hobbit. But then as we chatted, I was like, no, this is Gandalf. <laughs> this is a magic beautiful, eloquent gift of a person. And I'm so glad you guys are here. A lot of you probably don't know who James is, and that does not matter. Just imagine uh, that you're sitting with me and him by a, by a crackling fire and just absorb, crackling fire, but just absorb the wisdom. That's what I did. This conversation touched me, changed me. Everything he says and does is just poetry. Um, including his new book, which is called uh, The Healing Path, which is incredible. He also has a podcast called Turning to the Mystics, where he um, dissects and breaks down a different mystic from different traditions. He's incredible. Uh, he teaches at the CAC, the Center for Action and Contemplation, which is Richard, uh, Richard Rohr. As you know, I love Richard Rohr. Uh, that's his organization, and uh, James is a master teacher there. So I'm so glad to have been able to visit with him, and I'm so glad we recorded it, and I'm so glad you guys are here to listen to it. Do check out The Healing Path. It is incredible, uh, and it is out. It is available right now. Um, I'm also on tour. If you're hearing this the day that this comes out, I'm gonna. I'm about to tape my special. Uh, I believe it's on the sixth, June sixth. That sounds right. Early June, <laughs> I believe, on the sixth, uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, I'm also going to be in a bunch of other places coming up. Cleveland comes to mind. Denver comes to mind. Go to PeteHolmes.com. I'm going to be touring for a while. Uh, so if I'm coming to, to a town near you, it would mean a lot. The shows have been so great. Madison and Milwaukee this past weekend were incredible. So hope to see you out. I'm so proud of this hour. It's so fun. Uh, and the special taping. For tickets to the special taping, uh, f which is going to be incredible. Go to PeteHolmes.com for all of that. We're also brought to us by our friends at Magic Mind. You guys hear me talk a lot about Magic Mind. It is definitely the product uh, that has changed my life the most in the past years. It is an elixir, basically. It's a magical elixir that helps you focus better on your work, be more creative, and drink less coffee. Their slogan is do more, stress less, because it has adaptogens in there that help you cope with stress, it has nootropics that help you focus and be creative, just a little bit of caffeine, a little bit of honey. It's incredible. It tastes amazing. And there's a mix of 12 functional ingredients, including matcha and other things that help you fight off stress and to dial in and focus. In fact, dial in is the perfect way to put it. It doesn't get you wired. In fact, it's a great substitute for coffee. Sometimes instead of that second cup, I'll just have a magic mind or I take a magic mind with my first cup and that's all I need for the day. 30% more done on average, five to seven hours, 30% more productivity. Imagine what you would do with that. Fighting off procrastination, brain fog, fatigue. I'm, I'm actually sitting at this computer behind me. I'm doing some writing today. Absolutely take a magic mind before I do that. Getting you easy, easy, easy into that flow state. And they have a money back guarantee. Any first purchase will be refunded. No questions asked if it doesn't meet your expectations. And we have a special deal. Go to magicmind.co slash weird and use discount code at checkout weird for a limited 20% off your first order. That's magicmind.co slash weird and use discount code weird. Support your mind, support your body, support your creativity, and support this show. Love Magic Mind. Obsessed. All right, everybody. Let's get into this chat with James Finley. So glad you're here. Get into it. I thought, for, I mean, I, I said it off, but now we're recording. I'll say what a pleasure. It's so nice to be here with you. Thank you. And with Katie in your beautiful home. I thought I'd start. I felt it felt appropriate. I was looking for a bathroom. <laughs> I wonder how much wisdom or truth we could extrapolate from just the experience of me driving to your place and I had to pee uh, and I was looking for a bathroom and I parked. First of all, finding parking, very difficult. 
And then I went into a Starbucks, and I don't know if you know, the Starbucks closest you just doesn't have a bathroom, which well, I, that's right, it does. Which yeah. is inappropriate. They're in the bath. Yeah. They're in the public BM business. Yeah. <laughs> and they also Creating serve coffee. Creating the reason why you need a bathroom. Exactly. And they don't give one. It's full circle, but they're only, it's a half circle. It's not right. It's not right. And I went in and I was shocked. I literally thought that's one of their main functions yeah. in society is, it's not just me, but unhoused mm -hmm. people and stuff. They know Starbucks has got yeah. them covered, but I, I couldn't go. Yeah. But I was looking at the suffering, meaning using Richard's definition, uh, out of control. Yeah. I like that, that definition. And I was noticing how much I was creating at the anxiety that I was like, what if I never find one? You know, you have that yeah. childish voice, I'm going to explode or be humiliated or something. Or for me, it's like, I, I'm not special, I'm not loved. If, I, if no one will let me in. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and give me the help. Right. I, I feel that. And then eventually I did find a restaurant and I walked in and I was just real honest. I was like, they, they seemed closed. I was like, look, I'll, I'll buy something. Yeah. It's a real hat, man. I'll buy something. I just need a bathroom. And he was like, he got, and, it, and there was real love in it. There really was. Yeah. I felt it. He, he yeah. made a choice to go, please use the bathroom. Tell me, tell me what you take from that oh, here's little story. Here's what I take from the story. Tiny story. I look on it as the physiology of spirituality. <laughs> and Thomas Merton says, he says, perhaps a great deal of our difficulty in the spiritual life could be cured by simple respect for the body. Mm. Like we're incarnate beings, you know. And that includes the mind. It, yeah, it includes, yeah, we're incarnate bodily in the mind as incarnate as in the brain. The brain, that's it. But yeah. then also the mind is ontological and spiritual, it's not material. Right. And uh, so we're this incarnate uh, alchemy yeah. of the physical and, this, and, the, in, and the invisible and the spiritual. And there was, so God hiding and needing to pee, or, or God... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, God's hiding until you have these kind of sensitivities and it's not hiding anymore. Right. You know, go take a holy pee and be grateful. It was a glorious pee. Yes. It wasn't a pee. And you know what? I was totally there for it. You yeah, know what I yes. mean? Yes. Mindfulness. Yes. And it was the, I, I often think of the bowstring of, of the tension. Yes. So we're putting tension on the right. arrow was me not being able to find parking, me not finding a yep. bathroom. And, and, but it informed Val, my wife Val and I talk all about how we, we want to push the pleasure buttons. Right? Yeah. We want to feel good, we, even spiritually. I want to feel transcendent. I want to feel peaceful. I want to feel bliss or joy. But everything, no matter how many times I've learned this lesson, is informed by the, the yeah. tension that came before yeah. it. Is that? Another insight I've had, too, is that, um, that God is, God is uh, being infinitely poured out and given away, holding complete in and as the primordial rhythms of our days. <laughs> So standing up and sitting down, waking up and going to sleep, mm. being alone and being with others, God's the infinity of those rhythms. Mm. Then I say, and God's waiting for us to discover her there. Mm. It's like God forever comes to visit, but we're rarely at home because we're probably out buying a spiritual book somewhere. Oh no, <laughs> don't say that. And a lot of monastic life is about this. It's, it's like an endlessly ordinary life. You know, it's just endless ordinariness. I, you yes. live in silence, you chant the Psalms, you work in the fields. Yes. And you have uh, one bowl. Don't you have like you, one bowl? You, you, you had a, no, you had a, when I was there, you had a soup bowl. It was vegetarian meal. Yeah. You had a soup bowl with yesterday's vegetables in it with water mixed for the soup. <clears throat> and then you had a plate on top of that with two vegetables and bread <laughs> and water. You got to do bread because Jesus said it. And fruit drink and then coffee, a mug of coffee. Okay, at least I give you coffee. That was a meal. But I liked the, this, when I, have you seen the movie Into Great Silence? Into, yeah, I love that movie. It's a great movie. No one knows this movie. I uh, love that movie. It, whoever wrote that knows. That's really, whoever that's wrote the that? life I lived at the monastery. Yes. You ever, they had the intuition. That, yes. Yeah. And so for people that don't know, they led this French documentary crew into a monastery. The Carthusian Monastery of Hermits. Carthusian. Isn't it fun that we sometimes do live in a Tolkien book? Like there are people called the Carthusians yeah, exactly. <laughs> that live in a castle. <laughs> and a lot of Tolkien, really, I was thinking about it on uh, the creative imagination. Yeah. And uh, that came out of Tolkien's imagination mm. as, uh, as a religious sensitivity to the nature of reality. Yes. You know, on the mythic... Uh, rhythms and layers of reality. And yes. It's brilliant. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna write down Tolkien so we don't forget that because I, I completely agree with you. Going back to those rhythms, have you, I, I'm assuming you have. 
<laughs> Meaning I don't want to feel silly for asking you an obvious question, yeah. but has there ever come over you that even in our physiology, there's give and take, there's inhale, exhale. Do you, you know those moments where it seems so obvious? At other times, the mystery seems so distant. And then other times you're just like, it's right, it's right here. It's, it's in my breath. It's in eating and excreting and sleeping and waking. Uh, yeah, here's one way I put it is um, uh, when, when, we, when we inhale, uh, the body doesn't stop to see whether or not it's going to ex accept the inhalation. Like, wow. we've got to question you first. Right. Because the body is the acceptance of the next inhalation. The body is the acceptance. And, which is receiving yes. the gift of life. Because if, yes. if you don't inhale, the rest of the day won't go well. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like we're running roughshod <laughs> over the depth of what we're looking for, and it's present in the breath. Mm. And likewise, when we exhale, we exhale ourselves. So in the re and also notice that although we don't know how many times we've inhaled and exhaled from the day we were born, mm. no matter how many times you have inhaled, it's this equal to how many times you've exhaled plus or minus one. Right. So there's a rhythm built right in. <laughs> That's a big plus or minus one it's right there. It's a huge one. It's a huge. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when Maureen died, she died right here in the living room mm. in house hospice. Yeah. And I watched her I was sitting right next to her holding her hand. And, uh, and uh, she exhaled and didn't inhale. Mm. And I thought, that's what death is. Death is, is, it's not an event, it's a cessation. It's the end, you know. And I could tell right away she wasn't there anymore. Huh. Like she was right there. And, and then she wasn't. She, and then she wasn't there, yeah. Greater than the sense of human heat or body warmth. Exactly. That we're yeah. not, re we're not, we're, we're, incarn we're incarnate in and as our body, but we're not reducible to the body. Right. Yeah. I, th is it the, I think it's Chinese then that says it's like breaking a vase and the air that was in the vase is released. Yeah. It's an image that stuck with me yeah. about death. But isn't it funny, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the ego or our thinking minds, our monkey minds, would actually prefer a system where the body checks the breath and goes like, is this worthy? Is this worthy of us? <laughs> like, yeah, it's too, what I think it is too, is, is, is there's a, a level at which... Um, we experience and need a sense of control over the situation. Mm. And that's real. You know, there's the schedule and am I keeping up and what do I have to do? Mm. But the need to control overstates its case. <laughs> <laughs> that's a yeah. big overstates See, its case. Because we're, we're, we're not, like I said, we didn't bring ourselves into existence. We can't keep ourselves in existence as evidenced by death. Yes. And so we don't belong to ourselves. Yeah. So can I learn to trust? So when I take a breath, like from whence does it arise? Mm. And so I'm trying to learn. It's like with love too, like intimacy and in deep surrender. There's a kind of a control or order to a loving relationship. But the essence of it is surrendering, people surrendering themselves over to the kind of ecstasy of love or the mm. rhythms of love yeah. that, that transcends what they can control. Yes. Because if they can control it, it wouldn't be love. Right. You know. Well, the William Blake poem, uh, uh, a man in a room sit together, speaking or not speaking, yeah. loving, I'm paraphrasing it poorly, yeah. but loving a third thing that neither of them can see. Uh, again, I, I'm hoping no, you just are that's, aware that's, of that. That's exactly right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I and should know it better. We read it at my wedding, damn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but people go. can look it up. It's a beautiful poem. It is. Oh, here's here's pictures of Maureen and I when we met and she died. Yeah. And here's our wedding vows. Here, I'll read it to you. Please. Uh, we were uh, both spiritual directors and psychotherapists together. Mm. <laughs> this is our wedding vows. <clears throat> I, James Finley, take you, Maureen Fox to be my wife from this day forward, to love, cherish, and care for till death do us part. I vow to you my honesty and vulnerability day by day, walking our walk into all our unknown tomorrows. I know that to grow I must continue dying, and it is you I choose to live and die with, head to head, toe to toe, soul to soul, this day and forever. Mm -hmm. You are truly my best friend, lover, and soulmate, the one through whom God calls me to be my true self. This day, I vow to accept this call. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, wow. She wrote that. Beautiful. Wrote that. And you got to do it. 
Uh, yeah. You plagiarized her. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it was that is gorgeous. Yeah. What a gift that you gave us for sharing that. Yeah. That's that. That's that energy, isn't it? As you were reading that, I've been married twice. The first time was as a fundamentalist. The second time was as a, as an aspiring mystic. Hopefully, getting more in touch with that William Blake. But the first time, it was so much more to do with whether or not we had had sex. As you were talking, the absurd, you said lover, the absurdity of going like, had you two slept together, you know, before your wedding? That's yeah. what it got turned into. Me too. When I left the monastery, I got married right away and ended in divorce. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, you have two daughters from that marriage, which is a real grace. I'm very close to both of them. Mm. And um, just all unraveled, fell apart. Mm. When I got my doctorate, for my, I got a scholarship for my doctorate in psychology, and we moved out here. Part of it was the stress of the doctorate, but it was pr it was troubled. Mm. We were both troubled and kind of half crazy, really. Yeah, and fell apart. And then that's when I met Maureen. So did, isn't that how it goes? Just reminds me of my own story. But the monastic life, were I feel like you maybe had been incubated a little bit, or is that unfair? To be catapulted yeah. into maybe the most secular thing, <laughs> you know, like a marriage. Yeah, I would say in a way, yes, because, see, because this is just before the Vatican Council, so some of it's changed. Mm. But then we slept on a straw mattress on boards in a common dormitory, just partitions. In the monastery. Yeah. 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 Got up at 2.30 in the morning. I chanted the psalm seven times at the canonical hour. When hours. are we going to bed if we're getting up at 2.30? Seven o'clock. Okay. That's not horrible, I guess. Yeah. It cloistered, so you, there was no active ministry. You didn't help in nothing, you just, it was the hidden life. And no one came in mm. either, so it was a cloistered hidden life. Mm. No television, no radio, no newspapers, well, nothing. Uh, I was, it was like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. No one goes in and no one comes out. Right. You know. Except instead of chocolate, you have temperance. Yeah, and you have, what, what it is really is God. I tell people that in my time that I would sit with Thomas Merton in spiritual direction. Mm that I thought that all of our sessions together, there were like three questions there. One was he would ask, how's it going? Mm. That's what's it like being you living here? You came here to live. Did you just feel like where you belong? Mm. Secondly, he would ask, how's it going? And you're surrendered to the mystery that accessed your heart and brought you to this place that it might transform you into itself. <laughs> See, I'm gonna need you to say it again. How, yeah, how's it going? And you're surrendered to the mystery, God. Yes. How's it going? You're surrendered to the mystery that accessed your heart and brought you to this place that it might transform you into itself. Divinization through love. Because <laughs> God is love. See, what would it mean? Yes. There'd be nothing left of you but love. Yes. And uh, That's and, a great question. Uh, yes. Doesn't and, it break your heart a little bit that we just say, like, have you seen, look, I'm not putting it down, but yeah. have you seen the new blah, blah, or have you have you eaten it's, this or whatever? Not that we can't have God and all of that too, yeah, but yeah, exactly. that question just made me kind of well up a little bit. Yeah, I do think, and then he said the third question was, mm. how's it going in you, you being faithful to experiencing the depth of the second question? percolating up to the messy, unresolved details of the first question. Because <laughs> you know, you're still just trying to find your way through another day. Yes. You know, you're still just you. Right, after the ecstasy of the laundry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but the, what is it when the laundry's infinite? <laughs> you know, see what don't, Because it's God yes. being poured out and given away as the laundry and it's nothingness without God. Yes. So what would it mean to be, to, to be sensitized to that? You know, like the, everything's deserving of respect or even reverence mm. in its ordinariness. Mm. And so this life then becomes a life of kind of incarnate infinity intimately realized. So when I left the monastery, it was like culture shock coming out here. Mm. But then I realized I still wanted to live that way. So how does one live this way in the world? See, how does married life or single life or divorce life or parenting or a long-term illness or teaching children in a classroom how does it have built right into it the capacity to find one's way to this depth dimension mm. of it and then live by it and share it with others? Do we know? Yes. I mean, we, we, <laughs> that's the path. I was hoping you would say yes. yes. How, did it, how did that unfold for you? I, I asked Father, Father Greg Boyle, I was like, where do we find our, 
rejuvenation. He goes, in every damn breath, is what mm-hmm. he said. And I was like, what a great response. I think, um, um, well, first of all, I, I would put it this way, is that um, uh, we're, living, we're, we're living our day-by-day life, doing our sincere best to be um, a, a present, engaged, vulnerable, honest, tender-hearted person, mm. knowing that we stumble and fall over and over again, and knowing that every time we fall, our acceptance of our frailty is the portal through which the mercy of God sustains us mm. like an infinitely loved, broken person. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I'm living it in a situation like I'm in it. This is, this is our situation. I'm always in a situation. Mm. And <clears throat> then there are certain moments when I'm graced with a touch of the divinity of life. So Merton talks about the new seeds of contemplation at the end. He says, uh, say you're out walking in the midst of nature and you turn to see a flock of birds descending. And as if out of the corner of your eye, you catch something in their descent that's primordial, vast, and true. And you pause and sit there like there's something sacred about it, something sacred about you being able to see that. He said, when we know love in our own hearts, like intimate communion with someone, uh, reading a small child a good night story, lying awake in the middle of the night listening to your breathing, the smell of a flower. Mm. There are certain moments where we're grazed. We're, like we're suffering. We get the feeling that I think, too, that we're, we're carried along by the momentum of the day's demands, sensing that we're skimming over the surface of the depths of our own life, like mm. we're suffering from depth deprivation. Depth, depth, depth. And the tragedy is that God's unexplainable oneness with us is hidden in the depths over which we're skimming. Yeah. But in these fleeting moments, there's like a descent, and we drop down into that depth, like we taste it. And just for a moment, we pause in it. Sometimes it's very intense, but usually it's very delicate. So then the next step is, then I think, is uh, we experience the desire to abide in the depth so fleetingly glimpsed. Mm. Like homecoming. I don't like living on the outer circumference of the inner depths of my own life, which I know is there because from time to time I taste it. Mm. And so then the path is, this this three, like tripod path, the path, is uh, we can't make these moments happen, but we can assume the inner stance that offers the least resistance to be overtaken by what we cannot attain. So lovers cannot make their moments of oceanic oneness happen. Mm. But together they can assume the stance that offers the least resistance to being overtaken one more time (laughs) with oneness and love. And poets can't make the poem happen, but they can assume the stance that offers the least resistance. Those committed to healing can't make healing happen. Mm. And so this is meditation practice. So it's like a daily rendezvous. It's a daily rendezvous. And Merton says, with God, a little sincerity goes a long, long way. Mm. Like, here I am, Lord. And he said, in the spiritual life, to understand is to realize that you're infinitely understood and that you belong to God. And so you sit, and usually how it begins then is this idea of Lexio Divina, discursive meditation and prayer. Lexio is you take a text, and the Christianers would be the Gospels. It could be any poet or saint or whatever time. And you would read it so if Jesus says, fear not, I'm with you always. Uh, Through the power of the Spirit who dwells in our hearts, we believe that the deathless presence of Jesus is personally telling us not to be afraid. Mm. He's with us always like this. And so the Lexio is attentive listening to words that are beautiful, and you know they're beautiful even before you think about it. Mm. The fact that he's with us always, come what may, up till death and beyond. Mm. It's beautiful. And then God, then the next step of the ladder is God says, now that I spoke to you, you talk to me. So meditation is a dialogue between ourself and God about fear and about presence about, and the third rung of the ladder is prayer, which is desire, like help me with this Mm -hmm. and what can happen. And then at the end of each sitting, like a rendezvous each day, and you ask for the grace to not to break the thread of that sensitivity as you go through the day. And if you do that daily, like fidelity to the rendezvous, little by little, it can become habituated through your day and can then blossom into contemplation, which is wordless union, like a oneness beyond words. And you can do that. Uh, you know what I mean? PSC, you can, it's a decide. Someone once said to, to, to live this way in today's world 
is like someone trying to make a U-turn at rush hour on the freeway. It goes against the stream. The world does not encourage us to do this. Yeah. <clears throat> but I say, unless I decide I'm going to live this way, you know, with utter sincerity and you just quietly do it. Mm. And uh, till it becomes habituated through your whole day, and people can do that. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, there's a page in Be Here Now where they talk about where you can find your faith from, and and one of the places, the holy text, and then one of them is is the idea that other people have done it. And I'm one of those people that I take great comfort in just hearing you say that. Yeah. I don't have to go all the way back to Christ or whoever. I can go ah. And I have experienced that in my own life, these little little steps. I don't want to say forward, but little steps. Well, I would say this too. I, I, I had no idea who you were. Yeah, my, sure. my daughters are great fans of yours. Oh, no way. And my grandchildren too. <laughs> they went, oh, wow, Pete's coming here. <laughs> like the round of applause. So I started watching your interviews, Conan and oh, no. or different things. Very funny. Very, oh, I really bright, appreciate very bright. that. But I think this too, and I talked to Richard Rohr about you wanting to talk to me, and he has such a respect for you. And uh, oh. so the sincerity of you wanting to have interviews like this mm. is that somehow your comedy embodies a way of sharing mm. something about the lightness of life. Mm. Do I mean it's like a little uh, yes. touch? It's a ping. Uh, you said it, 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 it is. It like yeah. it matters. Like where would life be without that? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I heard you talk about that. You look back on your life when a time like a conversation like this would have been absurd, you know, and, right. and the gratitude you and I can both have that we found, we found this. Cause when you say we skim across the surface of our lives, I'd like throw, I feel like that's the mass of men. That's, that's most people. It is. It is and actually, that's a heartbreaker. It is a heartbreaker. Somehow I put it to people too, as I say, um, like how has it come to pass that you've come to be the person who's even capable mm. of being concerned about such things at the level which... And is it not true that maybe a year ago or five years ago wasn't true? So you're on a path not of your own making. Otherwise, this would make no sense. Right. It would right. make no sense. And so how then can I be grateful for this path and keep leaning into it so it can keep getting deeper and deeper? Yes. Yeah. I have that with our the listeners of this podcast, believe it or not, because I go, who are you? I say this to the people listening now. Who are you that will not only look past but enjoy a comedian who talks about BMs at a Starbucks yeah, yeah. Or, or the graphicness of sex or, or, or the cruelty of the world That's right. swearing? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in for all of it. I love all... I I think it's all funny. I think it's all worth talking about. But so few people are interested in talking about Thomas Merton, contemplation, uh, coming to God by doing it wrong, not by doing it right. Richard Rohr, James Finley, uh, Father Greg Boyle, and also will enjoy a good diarrhea joke or whatever it may be. Like yeah. you lose. <laughs> so whoever is here, yeah, I go, who are you? Yeah, yeah, Merton, and I celebrate. Yeah, Merton in person was very funny. Yes. And uh, had a sense of humor. For example, when I was at the monastery, it was a Gothic church, and they, they redid it. They stripped it out, and so they, it's just the bare bricks and so on they, when they first built it. But then it was a kind of a redone, and the windows were done in Europe somewhere, these very tall Gothic windows. Mm. And uh, uh, St. Bernard Clairvaux in the 11th century founded the Cistercians, which is the order that Merton belonged to, mm. this cloistered monastery. He talked about contemplation as drinking Mary's milk. Mm. <laughs> and so they made a window of that. So this tall window, Mary's up in heaven with angels around her, and she's holding the baby Jesus, and the baby Jesus is leaning back, and she's squeezing her breasts, and Bernard's down on the ground at the bottom of the window, kneeling down with his arms like this, and his mouth open, and the string going in his mouth. And Merton says, you know, secretly over all these years, I've always called that window, Mary scores a bullseye. <laughs> He was so funny that way. He was so clever. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. There's something that that image is almost. It's so right. It's uncomfortable. Exactly. Yeah. And it has to do with this incarnate divinity of the details of ordinariness. Yes. And yeah. and uh, not the grossness, and not even the grotesqueness, but it's the obviousness, I suppose the milk and the sperm and egg and the yeah. blood and the, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like that, I like that image because it's not, it's not ignoring what's happening. It's not covering it in robes and, yeah. and pretending that it's all clouds and Michelangelo. It's sometimes something much more. Yeah, and that's, why I, that's why I always think too that, um, where I tell people in these silent retreats that 
uh, when we do sitting practice and all of it, we think we're waiting for some big thing to happen. Mm. And sometimes big things do happen. Merton once said, we're all holding off for someday we'll get zapped by God and they'll have to prop us up in a corner and fan us. You know, like we're kind of... <laughs> but I think like it's getting just, the vapors. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But I think sometimes things like that do happen, actually. Yeah. But what I think it is is, opposite, is calibrating the heart to a fine enough scale mm. that you can find in a single breath. Yeah. That you know the, the 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 that the generosity of the infinite is infinite, and we are the generosity of God, where the song God sings, mm -hmm. and it can get so quiet, or so delicate that you can there's a there's a sense of the you're touched by the truth of that, right? Which is contemplation. Yes. And then you can habituate that sensitivity through the day. Yes. Little by little, it's an underlying thing you just sense is always. The Buddhists say, you know, don't, don't grow a second head. I don't think here's your ordinary head, then up here is your enlightened head. Mm. So it's just the ordinariness of wiping down the kitchen counters or mm. looking out the window. Mm. And there's a felt sense like this matters, mm. you know, in a way that's beyond what I can explain. I got the image as you were speaking. It's like we're playing, as we grow older, we start playing on these pianos. You know, they make pianos for children mm -hmm. that are like just a few keys. It's just like one octave. Yeah. And we play on that and we feel like I'm a big piano thing. But really we can, as you said, recalibrate our sensitivity, right. open the, the iris on the camera a little bit more and let it in. That's right. Last night I was watching a Eckhart Tolle video. I think, you know, for all the things the internet gives us that might be distracting or strange or whatever. Sometimes you just stumble on an Eckhart Tolle and he starts talking about forgetting, not knowing what you are, meaning we're always trying to know what we are. We want to know our true self. And he's actually talking about knowing your true self by not knowing your true self, going beyond concept. And he's like, when you sink into something like doing the dishes so completely that you stop thinking and you stop thinking of yourself as a concept or God as a concept or the moment as a concept. And there's this quiet heavy, as I've heard you say, abyss that just kind of, it doesn't know, it doesn't have subject object. It's just made of knowing and That's it's true. accessible. That's really true. It's accessible while you're doing the dishes yeah. is, is what you're saying. Not just, again, like your, your marriage going, did you have sex before you got married? It's like, do you go to church? It's like, can you do the dishes? Right. It's true. <laughs> it's really true. Let's define, I'd love to hear, what were some of those things? People are going to wonder. Let's give the people, you know, the Ramana Maharshi quote, I give people what they want, so they want what I give. Mm -hmm. He'll tell the miracle stories. What is a story of something strange that happened? <laughs> maybe to you, maybe you're telling me that sometimes in deep meditation, strange things happen. Well, uh, sure. one was when I wrote my memoir, I told the story of my own experiences. Mm. And then sitting with, I worked with trauma for 30 years. So I just sat with people, listened to a lot of stories. Mm. So I'll share one story. A Please. woman shared with me when I was sure something that I experienced. Um, I was seeing this woman in therapy, and when she was a little girl, her parents never physically or emotionally or sexually abused her, but they would violently fight with each other in front of her, just terrify her. But they were so angry at each other, they couldn't see what they were doing to her, like she felt invisible. And she told me, and therefore she still feels invisible inside. That's why she was in therapy. Mm. And... Uh, she told me that one summer night they were screaming at each other and she opened the back screen door of the patio, went into the backyard in the dark and there was a tree in her backyard and she climbed up in the low branches of the tree and she said she closed one eye and lined up a twig with a star and said to God, if you know I'm here, make the star move to the other side of that twig. Like it'll just be between us. Right, I've done this. And she says, uh, God didn't move the star. And then she said, but there's something about the remembrance of myself sitting alone in the dark in the low branches of a tree waiting for God to move his star that consoles me. Mm. And I, say to, I said to her, you know, it's true that God didn't move the star. But in remembering that here with me, you were moved and sharing it. Mm. I could see it. Mm. And because you shared it, I was moved. And this is how God works in our life. Right. I said, so let's make a deal. In the therapy, anytime we feel stuck, we'll imagine we're sitting together in the low branches of that tree waiting for God to move a star. Because mm. I think that a lot of therapies like this, these shifts happen intimately. You know right. what I mean? It, it, it kind of, we build up to something and then there's this kind of dropping yeah. down. Yes. And a lot of the healing is, uh, the, that's the healing of the depth dimension, this yeah. unexpected descent 
into a grounded, intimate place. You can tell us, you can't explain it, yeah. but you know it's true. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Merton once said, uh, the most important things in our life are, are things we can't explain. There are certain things in life we simply have to accept as true or we go crazy inside. Mm. And they're the very things we can't explain to anybody, including ourselves. See? And Dan Walsh said, teaching a class of metaphysics at the monastery, he used to say, I know it, I know it, I know that I know it. But the trouble is, it's I who know that I know it. And when I try to tell you what it is that I know that I know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> because if everything you knew is what you could say, it would just be more of this. Yeah. Words, words. But there's something, there's something that's utterly transcending the yeah. sum total of all this, that's welling up and is the reality of all this. And I can taste it in a moment of awe mm. or mercy or art or silence or whatever. And I can learn to... And the words are sort of twice removed. It's funny. Yeah. We want... I'd love to hear you speak on this. We want the story of the star that moved. The movie would be about the star it that would, moved. No, it would, no, wouldn't be. But I think what I'm hearing you speak of is interior realities, which are so real. <laughs> Spiritual depths, psychological depths, emotional depths. And that's most of our experience. Like we can see all this, but really it's all in here. And that story you know, metaphorically, I'm experiencing a star move. We want it to happen out here, right? Does that make sense? But things that transform internally need to be celebrated as miracles as such too. Yes, yes. I, here's, how, here's how I see it. I think sometimes God does move the star. For example, I went to the monastery, radicalized me there at God. And um, years later, I met Maureen lived here with her for 30 years so she died god moved the star mm, mm. and uh i was in psychotherapy i got a doctorate uh when i got, left left the monastery i wrote merton's palace of nowhere i was a high school religion teacher and uh on merton's idea of the true self ultimate identity beyond ego and when that book came out um uh, i got invited to give silent retreats around the united states and canada and one of the first retreats I ever gave was a clinical psychologist who had read the book. And he said, if you'd be willing to commit yourself to exploring the contribution, the contemplative spirituality and the mystics make to mental health, I'll give you a PhD in psychology for free with family support, not alone. <laughs> I was living in Cleveland, Ohio, and I moved with my wife at the time and two small children came to Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena wow. and spent five years in full-time doctoral work and became a psychotherapist. So God does move the star. Yeah. But there's two things about it, though. When I look at each of these things, when you actually get there, what matters most isn't the details that enticed you at first. Because you know? whenever we want something and if we finally get it, isn't what we thought it was. Mm. But if we let it, it's even more than we thought it was. Mm. And it's messy challenges. It's a call like that. So in that sense, even when God does move the star, the, the interior star, the miracle, is an unexpected interior. This feels like it, I give yeah. people what they want, so it, they'll it, want it, what yeah, I Exactly. Give. And then also what happens, sometimes God doesn't move the star. Yeah. And God just doesn't. And so then you seek to find, that's why I say that this, the, the, this path is, uh, oh, here, give me this. I'll read this here. passage here. Someone asked me to say this on this. I just came from this retreat in Madison. I'm going to Madison. Oh, I was just there this weekend. In two weeks, Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, the Retreat Directors International, they had their national uh, thing there, and I gave the keynote oh, wow. there, and okay. it, was, it was great. And I gave another talk uh, with the Mindfulness Training Program people, and uh, it was in the building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Wow. You should go there. It's really, yeah. the talks are just like, it's just gorgeous. Oh, I love seeing it. So here's, here's, here's three quotes. On what on uh, when when the star doesn't move? Yes, please. <clears throat> Finding our way along the healing path does not consist of striving for some far off goal that we may or may not attain, but is rather a way of discovering a secret hidden deep within our hearts. Finding our way along the healing path does not consist of figuring out some obscure teaching, but rather consists of learning to see God hidden and revealed in all that we see. 
and finding our way along the healing path does not consist of mastering some method of meditation, but rather consists of learning not to do violence to the fragility of our waiting. Mm. Because somehow I think that if I'm waiting for something to be delivered from some pain or I mean whatever it is, uh, and it's not forthcoming, if I just sit and wait, something's given to me in the waiting mm. that's changing me. Like the star not moving. Exactly. I hear that, yeah. So it doesn't move, and yet, yes. See, what well, this, I've learned along the way, I don't know how to explain it. Mm. But I learned something about what matters most, or about you know what I mean, like the substance of things. Yes, but we're obsessed with the material. We the, are with something no, else. We're we are. Just, yeah. I might even if, say distracted by something else. Exactly. T. S. Eliot says, "I was distracted by the. I was distracted from the distraction by a distraction." Yes. You know, wait, pull, pull a number, wait, you're trying to be distracted by you later. Well, you're not even being fully distracted no. by what's distracting you. No, and, and, I, <laughs> and also what I think it is, too, is that, like, why, why, why is that? Right. And I think it's because um, we're uncomfortable with being quietly vulnerable in an intimate immediacy of ourself that we're not used to. Yes. That's what I was going to say. What don't we want to feel? It's, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And the trouble is, because we avoid that, which is also then people get married and they avoid that with each other. Yes. You know? They co-conspire to they, avoid. They co-conspire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they lead, even though they married looking for it. Yeah. And, but if you, if you go there, like why do people go to art museums? Or why do people, I think we're all, why do people come here and walk along the ocean out here? We're all looking for it. Mm. And yet, to find it, to drop down in the depths, we have to drop down through and accept layers of ourselves that have pain ribbon in it. Yeah. And we got to be willing to walk with that pain yeah. and to understand it and accept it, maybe get help with it. And that pain avoidance, which is the layers we have to go through to find the pure gold that's hidden underneath it, mm -hmm. keeps a lot of people at the edge of themselves, I we, think. We say this on the show all the time, most people would do way more to avoid pain than to gain pleasure. That's right. That's and true. that's, and, and uh, something else that came to mind, I'm sure you know it, Joseph Campbell says, the treasure we seek is in the cave we're afraid to go. That's right. But like sometimes it isn't going to law school, sometimes it's literally, can you get still enough to let these things Exactly. have your attention exactly and deal even with the existential yearning I, I my father i don't know why i could tell you why it would just take too long he asked me if i was afraid of god and and in, in offense i was like no because i've done all this work to not be afraid of god and i was like isn't it interesting it's it's so much more vulnerable and honest and true not with my dad because i don't want to give him the, the satisfaction but to quietly go am i afraid of god and get real about it like really look at that instead of just going, now he's love, everything's okay. <laughs> right? Yeah, the, there's a book out, I think his name is Douglas Steer, I can't remember, there's a little book on contemplation by Merton. Mm. And in the introduction, he says, I like this, he says, if God is who I think God is, mm. <laughs> that's a good if one. God is who I think God is, then finding God is safe enough. Mm. But what if God isn't at all who I think God is? And in his piercing presence, whole layers of who I thought I was fall away. Who can risk it? Mm. But likewise, the very thought, that you, Merton once said you could spend your whole life and never meet the person who was living your life. Ugh. Who can risk it? But then if that's <laughs> true, who can risk not doing it? Right, yes. The, the, uh, can, I, can I ask you, isn't or shouldn't the ego... So for those of you, I'm assuming some people might be joining us for the first time on this episode... We're dealing with a, some pretty basics, like we have an ego, which is our personality, our structure, our experiences, our psychological self, all sort of, it's, I present that to you as the character I'm sort of playing. But then there's my spiritual reality, the awareness upon which every, all my experiences are sort of writ. Wouldn't my, isn't it right that my ego would be a little bit afraid of God because of everything that will fall away in it or her presence? Yeah, here's the way I see it. This is Merton on the false self, the true self. Yeah. Um, See, what the ego is afraid, the, the, the false self is not our personality. God wants us to have a healthy personality. Because mm. if our personality isn't healthy, we suffer and other people suffer. Mm. So you wish you'd work on your personality. Mm. The false self is an illusion the ego has about itself and having the final say in who we are. Mm. But it doesn't have the final say in who we are. It's the face or the openness through which we are. So one way I put it is 
When I say myself, myself, there's the self of myself. And so I say I'm worried about myself, or I'm ashamed of myself, or I'm proud of myself. That's the self that I see. But if that's the self of myself, who's the my of myself? Who's the me who sees me? Mm. Now, at one level, I think the me who sees me is the internalized self of myself because I've internalized experiences, beliefs, and so on. But as it gets deeper in silence or in love or suffering, the, the my of myself becomes more and more non-distinguished from the infinite presence of God presencing herself as the self of myself mm. and my nothingness without God, mm -hmm. which is unity of experience. That's also Ramana Maharshi, God, Guru, and self. That's exactly, yes. that's exactly right. Right. So there is a deepest, deepest self. And I, I, to go back to the fear, though, I negotiate going, not to bring a, a hot topic into it, but sometimes when I, I've, I've had psychedelic experiences and every time I jump off that cliff, I have to go, this will never make sense to my ego because I'm about to do something to it that will give it no control. So it will never go, go for it, even though every time I get in that space, I enjoy it or I, I enjoy the merging and the selflessness of it. But does that make sense? It will ne I'll never be able to convince my ego to merge with God necessarily. I, I feel like... It, it comes along with the little willingness. That's as best as it can do. Does that make sense? It do, drugs are a little complicated in this sense. <clears throat> Done with guidance or with help, it can really be an expansion of ego. It's still ego. Right. But it's interior layers of ego. Sure. And, of course, many people, unfortunately, it goes the wrong way. You know, it ends up destroying them. Mm. But putting that aside... Yes, I didn't so, mean to bring no, in yeah, a hot no, no, topic. No, 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 it's, no, I, I opened all that. Yeah. So, but let's say that in any experience where there's a sleeping off into the surrendered place, yes. whether it be intimacy or solitude or that's right. the great... That's right, vulnerable. That's right. And so even though I know, I can't find my way to where my soul longs to go and stay where I am. See, I, I, can't, get, I can't stay in the familiarity where I am because I feel that it's claustrophobic mm -hmm. or one-dimensional compared to this more spacious place I want to go to. Mm. And therefore, this ego that's trying to watch out for me, because if I'm not in control, I'm not safe. That's what this aspect of the ego believes. Uh, that, that's always there. There's always that resistance. Yeah. But I do think this. I do think that over time, uh, in different modalities of the leap, that uh, the, the ego can calm down and be okay. It can get used to being transcended. Mm. Mm. If it that makes get, sense. You, it can it get, can get used, used to, to being to, as your homeland. Yeah. And it's even, so it's even then it's translucent to the deeper place. Yeah. You know, I had a big experience. It was a psychedelic experience. And the way that I calmed myself down to your point is I said, I promise we'll be back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that actually worked. That was as close as I could get to going like, I'm going to this strange place. But I'll be back. And I've heard, um, do you know Muji? He's a yeah, non dualist. I like, Bush, yeah. I like Muji too. He goes, he, he talks about <laughs> non dual awareness, kind of like visiting a room. And he's like, you take your shoes off. He goes, leave, leave your shoes outside. And he goes, also leave your mind outside. Yeah. But, it, but what I like about our shoes being next to our mind is we go into the room of no awareness or whatever, or no oneness. And it's beautiful and it's peaceful. And you kind of know. I'm going to put my shoes back on and I'm going to put my personality back on. It comforts the ego, to your point. Yeah, it's a story. I, I haven't shared this in a long time with people. Uh, <clears throat> there's a story that, um, that you've, there's a, a school of Hindu meditation um, that meets uh, every morning with a, a realized yogi. And they're very dedicated. So it meets like at five in the morning so they can sit and go to work. <clears throat> And uh, you go for the first meeting, the yogi is sitting there and all the people are coming in. <clears throat> and the yogi introduces the practice. He said, the practice is to inhale real, real, real slow, hold it for just a second, exhale real, real, real slow, and say one. Then inhale real, 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 real slow, exhale real, and say two, all the way to 10. Until you have the least distracting thought, you have to go back to one. Mm. Are there any questions? And he rings the bell, everyone bows. And, you, and your sitting goes like this. 
one back to one, one back to all. <laughs> an hour later, ring, any questions? You raise your hand, you say, I didn't get very far. He said, there's no rush. We're gonna do this every morning until we die. There's no rush. <laughs> <laughs> four, four years later, <clears throat> four years later, you're sitting there faithfully, one back to one, and all of it, and you didn't see this happening. You get to two. You get excited about it, and you gotta go back to one. <laughs> and then you say to yourself, oh my God, I'm not gonna make it. And that, that's the point, you never were. Yeah. You see, but uh, that, that idea of not making it, see? Right. something wells up and gives itself to you. Right, that, right. That can't be made. Right. It can't, it's not fabricated or achieved. It's it's a granting. I heard that you. Comes. you uh, I don't want to interrupt. I'm just trying to load you with this one. If we let our achievements define us, and or let our shame define us, I heard you say they don't get the final word that, that's on who exactly we are. Right. Please talk about that, because I, I I'm a four. I'm a f split right in the middle in the enneagram. I'm a four and a three. But I'm a little bit more four than three. But I'm, I'm a four. A, yeah. Oh, are you really? Yeah. Oh, I can tell by your purple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Mirabai too. Yeah, she's four. I, I, and, and we love fouring out. We oh, four we do. out big time. Yeah. It's, it's a great joy to four out with Mirabai. Yeah. <laughs> but I, the achiever in me, or or the four in me that wants to be special or different or not fit in, like I really hate being a member of a group. Um, but they don't get the last say on who we are. Now here's one of the ways that I see it. Dan Walsh, teaching medieval philosophy at the monastery, he said to belong to a contemplative community is to bear witness to your worth what the community is gathered for. Mm. And it's not about achieving anything. Mm. You know, it's a communal surrender to giving ourselves over to the mystery that's giving itself to us unexplainably mm. with every breath and heartbeat. Isn't that hard though to vanish into a... It's, well, you know, it's, it's, it's harder than hard. You can't. <laughs> you get a spiritual hernia trying to do it. You can't. You can't make it happen. It's not yeah. like mysticism or bust. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what you do is you lean into. It's like with all your heart, leaning into a receptive openness to what's in. That's the thing about the spiritual life too. I think we get. We've been awakened to something which, having tasted it, we know our life will be forever and complete without it. But we're powerless by our own powers to achieve it. Yes. And so then we have to depend on God to, to guide us and take us to, to herself infinitely, yeah. to himself infinitely. And that's practice. The little willingness. It's the, will, it's the willingness. It's the state of willingness. Yeah. And, um, and so what it is, it's hard, but it's not. It's, it's like this. It's hard to seek this, but having tasted it, it's harder not to do it. Yes. Because not to do it, you're selling your... It's like uh, how I put it too sometimes is that... Uh, that God has set as God created us in such a way that nothing less than an infinite union with the infinite love of God will ever be enough to put to rest the restless longings of our it's a setup. Yeah. 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 It's a setup. And we're always trying to pretend that if I just get more of this, it'll be enough. Say the thing about the crow, the more the shiny thing. Yeah, yeah, Merton says, uh, he said, our minds are like crows. They pick up everything that glitters, no matter how uncomfortable our nests get with all that metal in them. One more thing. One more thing. One more thing. Yeah. I caught myself thinking, and I can love myself in this, maybe this is the conversation I'll snap, you know, in the good, a good snap. Yeah. But then I, re I went, it actually, that whatever made me go, just this drive, just drive to see James. And here's another way I see it too. There's a play by Eugene O'Neill, I think, where this man and woman are meeting, they're falling in love with each other mm. and they're planning to get married. And he says, he says, since we're leaving, he says, I know I need to tell you something here. He says, I'm wearing a mask. <laughs> she says, you are? She says, well, take it off. He said, I can't take it off. If I took it off, you'd leave me. Mm. She says, but don't you understand? Now that I know you're wearing a mask, if you don't take it off, we don't have a real relationship. So in a fundamental, in a moment of existential courage, he lowers the mask. She sees his true face and she leaves him. Mm. Puts a mask back, she comes back. Like a mask marrying a mask. Oh. But what true love is this? True love is this. And this what, a, is, what a horrible play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But a lot of relationships are that way. Yeah. I'm wearing my mask, you yeah, wear yeah. your mask. Well, that's what Ramdas says. I'll tell you, you, I'll ignore that you're wearing a space suit if it's you ignore a, I'm wearing right. a space suit. So, but how it works is this way. This, I think this is married love or intimacy. Uh, you're wearing a mask, I'm afraid to take it off. I, you, I, you're wearing a mask. And so the other person says, you know, don't, I don't want you to take it off until you're ready to take it off. Yeah. 
because I love you. Matter of fact, let me adjust it for you a little bit. That's right. And the more you're uh. accepted and knowing that you're wearing the mask, the mask starts becoming translucent and your face shines through the mask. Mm. And real love is offering that to each other. A lot of psychotherapy is about this too. Yes. I think seriously. Safety. Really? Yes. Yeah, you, you're convinced that you are what's wrong with you. Yes. See? I, I summarize, I saw a great therapist for many years and what he said to me most was who cares? Yeah. And a beautiful who cares, but he was funny. He was That's like, right. Who cares? That's right. He goes, who cares? Yeah. Oh, and cares? it's actually a great question. Who, who cares? You could go real deep question. with you it. Like, with it. Zen so, on. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> like who? No, yes. I know it's true. It's what the owl is asking too. Hey weirdos. We talk a lot about anxiety and depression on the show. And I've personally struggled with both and have had friends whose lives have been completely transformed uh, by ketamine therapy, guided ketamine therapy, because sometimes it's not as simple as a new therapist or exercise, meditation, or diet. Sometimes you need something new to unlock your brain, and maybe that thing is ketamine therapy from Mind Bloom. There's a new tool to improve your mental health at home ketamine therapy, and Mind Bloom is the leader in at home ketamine therapy, helping safely help thousands of people overcome their anxiety and their depression. Unlike traditional talk therapy, ketamine works quickly and doesn't have the unpleasant side effects of traditional antidepressants. In fact, in a study of over 1,200 Mind Bloom clients, 89% reported improvements in their anxiety and depression after only two sessions. I personally have done guided ketamine therapy. I can swear by it. It is incredible. It is helpful. It helped me uh, just reframe my world. It's such a powerful tool. And right now, Mind Bloom is offering our listeners $100 off your first six session program when you sign up at mindbloom.com slash YMIW and use promo code YMIW. Take the first step and break free from your anxiety and depression with Mind Bloom. You can go to mindbloom.com slash YMIW, like you made it weird and use promo code YMIW. Those are the letters, mindbloom.com, YMIW. All right, and did you know, secondly, did you know we're eating and drinking roughly a credit card's worth of plastic a week? When I first read that, I was like, a year maybe. It's a week. That's right, the products that we use every day are ultimately contaminating our water supply, generating hundreds of micro, hundreds of microplastics that we end up ingesting. Luckily, our friends at Blue Land are set out to do something about it, to eliminate the need for single-use plastic in the products we reach for the most, like hand soap. Did you know that an estimated five billion plastic hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away each year? And if that's not bad enough, most cleaning formulas are 90% water, which is heavy to ship, leading to excessive carbon emissions, not to mention the nasty ingredients in them like chlorine and ammonia. But Blue Land is inventing cleaning essentials, is reinventing cleaning essentials, essentials to be better for you and the planet by offering endlessly refillable cleaning products with a beautiful cohesive design. It's one of my favorite things about it. The bottles look really cool on your countertop that look great and are better for you and the planet. Just fill the bottles with water. That's mostly what they are anyway. Drop in the tablets and wait for them to dissolve. Hand soap, toilet bowl cleaner, laundry tablets with clean ingredients you can feel good about and know you're doing something good for the planet and help us all eat a little less plastic. No more bulky cleaning supplies on your grocery run and refills start at just $2.25. I recommend their Clean Essentials Kit, which has everything you need to get started and comes in beautiful light scents like iris agave, fresh lemon, and eucalyptus mint. Blue Land has an offer just for weirdos. Get 15% off your first purchase of any product and get clean cleaning products that I love the look of and love that they're good for you and the planet. To get 15% off your first order, go to blueland.com slash YMIW. You won't want to miss this, blueland.com slash YMIW. That's blueland.com slash YMIW. All right, everybody, let's get back to the living wizard, James Finley. I, it's funny, the thing that brought me to, to you was Father Boyle, and he quotes you in in one of his books, <laughs> and it just blew me away. And we spoke about it briefly, you and I, over Zoom once. Um, w w you and I are, are comfortable using all these religious words. I think it'll fold even more people into the conversation if we talk a little bit about this. A God, I believe in a God who protects me from nothing, but sustains me in all in, things. In all things. I said to you, 
when I when I heard that, I was like, oh, I, I didn't. It, it's like you say, it's like the poetry of of the mystics. I go, I didn't know I needed that. I needed just that. You know what I mean? I picked right. it up and I was like, oh, it's exactly the shape of my pocket. I had this hole because so much atheism. Um, I had a brief for anti-atheism after my wife left me. She had an affair, my first wife. And of course, I mean, it's like the playbook. You either become extremely religious or you lose your religion. It's I went true. with the second one. That's true. And I think that the message of that, and maybe you can fold it into your own life or bring in your own experience, but Father Boyle makes the point, you know, people pass around the email forwards. This is the story of the guy who was going to the World Trade Center on 9-11, but he saw an old friend and they went to breakfast and then he his life was spared. And these words get passed around and we love those stories. It's a little bit of a star moving story. And then we go, but what about the 3,000 people who, who went to work that day? And when I heard your quote, it, that seemed like the beginning of a salve for a new way of looking at divinity, not as a bodyguard who believes a lot of the same things we believe, a good life, a long life, a comfortable life, a flourishing life, like a successful Western productive uh, affluent life is valuable. But like, can you speak a little bit to that? No, I threw a lot at you just then. Oh, no, it's fine. It's good. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I, as I say, first of all, when we use God language, you know, in a way it's true. I mean, God, it, there's a truth to that. There's a way to understand that Abba, Father, God takes care of us, watches over us, and and so on. So there's a truth to that. But there's another layer of it, and every trauma survivor knows this. I'm a trauma survivor. Every trauma survivor knows whatever it means that God takes care of us, it doesn't mean that God takes care of us. <laughs> And the way I put it, here in Los Angeles tonight, there are little girls are going to be incested again. And no one's going to stop it. God is not going to stop. Their little boys are going to be beaten again. Again, God's not going to stop it. No one stopped me. No one stopped my father from beating me. Many times, yeah. actually, until the day until I left home, actually, 18 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. See, so, and this is the mystery of the cross. The whole mystery of the cross is that whatever it means that God takes care of us, it doesn't mean that God prevents the, the cruel or the... Un How I put it is this way. There's no place on this earth so pure or innocent or safe that the cruel, the ugly, the destructive, and the unfair just might not find you and bring you down. Mm. Every trauma survivor knows that. Mm. This would be a recipe for despair if it were not knowing in your heart through faith that the darkness of this world has no refuge from a love that transcends it and permeates it unex unexplainably in all directions forever. Transcends and permeates. It transcends and permeates and doesn't take it away. Mm. God depends on us to do our best to prevent it and to take it away when it occurs. But grounded in the peace is not dependent on the outcome of our efforts because maybe I'm not going to be able to take it away. Mm. But that's not the point. That's not the point. So I am sustained unexplainably, come what may. And the whole mystery of the cross, I think, is the Christian metaphor. Every religion has its own metaphor for this, for the Buddhist, the great death, and so on. And uh, so that's how I see it. Mm. You know? And that's why people often would come to me for therapy, trauma survivors, because they wanted their spirituality to be a resource in their therapy. Mm. And uh, so as you lay back the layers, uh, to getting close to the hurting place, Mm. And then how I put it is that when we risk sharing what hurts the most in the presence of someone who will not invade us or abandon us, we can learn not to invade or abandon ourselves. Mm. You can be reparented in love mm. where someone just treats you the way you deserve to be treated from the day you were born. Yeah. That's true. Even deeper, when we risk sharing what hurts the most in the presence of someone will not invade us or abandon us, we can unexpectedly come upon within ourselves what Jesus has called the pearl of great price, mm -hmm. the invincible preciousness of yourself mm -hmm. in your brokenness. Yeah. Merton says there is that in us that is not subject to the brutalities of our own will. No matter how badly you trash yourself, you can't do anything to this because it belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And to find that pearl shining bright in the broken place and then to learn to live by it and draw from it to touch the hurting places. Mm. That's one way I understand the healing path. And as Leonard Cohen said, the cracks are what helps us get to the pearl. Right? Exactly, the light shines out. Falling up. That's right, exactly. Doing it wrong, not doing it right. Yeah. But that pearl isn't James, 
after a good cup of coffee, right? <laughs> the, the pearl <laughs> isn't James being articulate or, or on or That's true. funny, right? I mean, That's true. because there's a temptation as you're speaking to go, wait, this is, I can be the, the pearl of great price. It's not. It, there's a disappointment. I, Trungpa Rinpoche says enlightenment is the ego's ultimate disappointment. Uh, uh, I, I, I share a story <laughs> in the book that when I first went to the monastery, I read Merton for four years, sustained me through the drama. A severe PTSD, dissociative disorder. And mm. I didn't even know I had it. You know, I just was that way all my life. Really. I'm not trying to be funny, but how could you, right? I yeah, mean, I started when yeah. I was three years old. And, yeah. You know. <clears throat> so when I went to the monastery, I couldn't believe I was going to sit with Thomas Merton for my spiritual director. Mm. You know, and I was right out of high school. Did it just happen? You didn't have to like wait in the Merton line. No. Well, you, I, he was novice master. Yeah. And so he, he gave spiritual direction to all the novices because you entered for six months as a postulant, and two years as a novice before you took temporary vows. Uh. So he was the novice master to help you discern if it was your vocation or not. Oh, wow. So he introduced me to the mystics and my own experiences that I was having. He helped me understand them. And, mm. so, on. and so, but when I wanted to see him, <clears throat> because of my trauma, I had issues with authority figures. So I, when I started to talk, I was hyperventilating, but nervous. Mm. And he wanted to know what's wrong. And I, I said, my voice was shaking. I said, I'm scared because you're Thomas Merton. And I was so embarrassed because I wanted him to think well of me. And here he saw the me that I didn't want anyone to know about, the including mask. me. The mask came off. Yeah. And he said this to me. He said, I worked on the farm, the pig barn, the big farm. Like the prodigal son. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, every day, I want you to finish afternoon work early before Vespers. Come in here, knock on the door sit down and tell me one thing that happened at the pig barn that day. Mm. I remember inside the voice that I can do that. Mm. And I'd knock on the door and he'd put the typewriter aside. He was always working on a book. And he remembered all this, like house out number five, house your foot, and he would tell pig jokes. And, <laughs> and it leveled the playing field. Then it opened up this whole conversation about mystical union with God and mystical longings. And mm. he led me to the teachings of the... I'll never forget that moment uh, about mercy, you know, that he gave you something you could do. You, you were, could you were do. hyperventilating yes, and shaking. I, yeah, it was, it was so uh, em empathically tenderhearted. Yeah. It just opened the door like I, that. Just, I was so touched like that. You it's know? gorgeous. I was sitting with my friends, the Gungers, and they have a 12-year-old daughter. And I won't give you the whole story, but, but she said... Uh, something about J.K. Rowling. I don't know if you know J.K. Rowling. Do. Sort of got canceled uh, for saying something uh, that people perceived yeah. as transphobic. I know that story. I don't know the story. That's why I'm being delicate with my language. I, uh, I'm not taking a stand. See how careful I have to be. But um, the the 12-year-old girl went, I don't like J.K. Rowling. She stinks or whatever. And the parents were like, why? And and like so many of us, she didn't know why. She just knew that that's what was happening. But then this is the mistake I think I made. I went, well, you know, at this point in her life, <laughs> what am I doing? I go, belonging matters so much more than being informed and taking the correct stance on J.K. Rowling. She's just trying to make a tribe. And I, and I thought of you, because I've heard you speak about that going, instead of saying, tell me one thing that happened at the pigs, I went, well, really, you just want an identity so badly. You'll say anything it's true. to belong. And what, of course, did the girl say? She said, I don't want to talk about this anymore and, and, and went away. You know, not, not just to me. It, no, wasn't, it's true. it wasn't that good of a story that she went, stop it, and walked away. She just sort of locked up. But Merton heard you, I, I've heard um, Rupert Spira say, I hear people calling out in the woods. It's my job to go into the woods and find them and yeah. then walk them out, yeah. not yell from outside the woods. You're just trying, you're 12, you're trying to have identity. No, like true. that's what I was doing. That's really true. Yeah. They say in therapy, you know, the, the therapist makes the asocial response. See, the social response is advice. An opinion. Everyone's got an opinion. Yeah. The way I see it, why don't you try this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The asocial response is um, uh, you share what you were sharing, whatever it is. And the therapist might say something like, um, well, I'm going to ask you a question so I understand you better. Mm. I get the fact that, that what I don't quite understand is this. Mm. Could you help me more with that? Right. And you, the person should say, and the therapist might say something like, let me say it back, so edit it for me, so we're together. Yeah. So, I have another question. And little by little by little, we get close to the hurting place, and we can tell because you'll tear up. Yeah. Or you'll laugh when you say something sad. Yeah. And then the therapist says, you know, if we don't get close enough to touch it, it'll keep festering. 
But if we do move too fast, it won't be safe in here and nothing will happen. Wow. Therefore, how can we learn here wow. see, to find an alliance that will make it safe for you to do what you came here to do? Wow. And, uh, it's, uh, and I think more we can learn in therapy how to relate to everybody that way. You know, when I benefit from it, we have a, a, a partner or a somebody, and we can kind of learn that art. Yeah. Of, uh, yeah. This whole time you've been speaking, Val is a master of what you're saying, being a safe place where I can take yeah. my mask off. She's, yeah. a, I call her a, a love genius. I'm reminded <laughs> also when someone has a delusion, I'm Napoleon, the classic, or I'm Christ. Although, <laughs> let's not get started on whether or not we're Christ. They'll lock us up. Um, but if someone says I'm Napoleon... The first step is to say, uh, you are Napoleon. I, I've heard this, that you're supposed to meet them, not not immediately go, you're James Finley, you're not Napoleon, wake up, it's 2023. Like that's the wrong energy. It's not safe. Like you said, it's not safe to go towards it because all you've met is resistance, which is just kind of empowering the delusion. Yeah, you, well, first of all, it's in layers. <clears throat> now you say the person who thinks he's Napoleon, the person who... Who knows he's Napoleon? Yeah. The the person who thinks he's Napoleon and worries about it goes to therapy. He's neurotic. Yeah. The person who knows he's Napoleon and worries about the therapist because the therapist isn't bright enough to see that they're Napoleon is psychotic. Yes. They, yes. <laughs> and uh, and and so they live in a castle in the sky, and the psychiatrist collects the rent. Mm. Pays the fee for the. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right because if the person really thinks they're Napoleon, like it, the therapist would write on the notepad, uh, delusions of grandiosity, it's mental illness. Mm. So you're exactly right. You wouldn't say no, you're not. You would form an alliance with the person, and go from there on the treatment plan with that. Similarly, to for spirituality, my ego says I'm Pete Holmes. I'm a comedian. I am successful. I am uh, tall. I am from Boston. And I feel the voice of God saying, okay, let's start there, right? I right. feel the same gentleness. When we talk about the things that aren't working, what, what, tell me. <laughs> My wife used to tell me I'd go on these retreats. You know, sometimes there'd be a lot of people on these retreats. Yes. And just a lot of people express this kind of, I don't know what it is, like reverence or yes. it's kind of like this. And she, uh, there's a story in the gospels where a woman had a flow of blood. She said, if I but touch the hem of his robes, I shall be made whole. Yeah. So when I would walk through the door from a retreat, she would say, Are there, were there many hammers there? Hammers. <laughs> what you touch? Yes. And once I was, I was at the end of a retreat, I was autographing books at the end. I felt something of the cuff of my pants. There was a guy kneeling on the floor behind me, touching the cuff, hemming the hem of my, and his wife was taking his picture. He hemmed the, you. Yeah, he hemmed me. Chris so Hemsworth. They took, they took off. <laughs> yes, oh was, my yeah. gosh. It was the funniest thing. That's a great Sam Cooke to song too. I think it's an old gospel song, but yeah. if I could just touch the hem of it. Yeah, hem, exactly. But Sam Cooke does it. Yeah. But I know, I know that is brilliant. And then you <laughs> had the person that you could come to and sort of laugh about yeah, and it. And like with your wife, the great thing about her, she was so grounded in this. This was our marriage, really. We yeah. both had a trauma history. She had a lot of AA stuff. And it's just somebody where you're just uh, just yourself. Yes. And it's not a function that people see you through because of what it helps them do when you do that gift. It helps them. Yeah. Mental health, or I mean, it's, it's important. It's But then there's something deeper that's not reducible to a role that we play. Mm. It helps people, and there's something like innermost about it. Mm. And I think that's the ground of the soul, kind of. Val is, you would love Val. I hope you get to meet her. Uh, I hope she gets to meet you, too. But she's, I'm, I'm top down, and she's bottom up. Mm. So I come home, and I tell her the world is an illusion, and <laughs> whatever it might be, whatever in thing I'm playing with. And she goes, and also... Uh, you seem kind of stressed out. Maybe let's get a blanket on you and like yeah. get on the couch. Yeah. And that seems so non-productive or whatever. Or let's dance. She she might put on music and no. be like, let's just dance. Yeah. Or yeah. or let's make dinner. Let's smell right. oil and and garlic. Let's. I know that it sounds like I'm painting her as like a matriarch or like a classic woman. I, those just happen to be the examples that come to mind. But what a gift. That's what I mean. The, the, I I see a. A gentleness. I'm being. I feel pursued. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense by the divine? Yeah, yeah. I feel it looking for me, 
and it'll get me either way. So when we talk about things that don't work, uh, we're addicted to our phones, we can't stop being productive or email or money, there's even a grace hidden in that because it doesn't work. Talk about skimming on the surface. Isn't there something about... So let's think about a future where AI and technology is giving you everything you want. We already have it bringing whatever food you desire, whatever movie you'd like to watch, whatever music you'd like to hear. Isn't there kind of a a little smart bomb of grace in there too that it goes, it's not going to work? I I would say this. I would say this. It may or may not come close to giving everything that we want, but it won't give us what we need. Yes. Because the sum total of the gathering together of what we want is qualitatively impoverished (laughs) compared to the depth of the need, which has to do about love or presence or fulfillment or surrender Mm. or gratitude. You know, we, you know, that's the dowry of our soul in a way. Mm. And, uh, so that, that's the thing about that. I think this is what I'm trying to teach my daughter is she goes, I want ice cream. And I'm like, you had ice cream yesterday. And she's like, but I want ice cream again. And we go, well, that's the want monster. There's always another want. <laughs> and she buys into that. Yeah, she, well, she oh, doesn't buy into exactly. it. No, absolutely not. <laughs> I'll give her the ice cream if she at least tolerates me saying, at least let's notice that this is a never-ending thing. Once when my oldest daughter, she was maybe five, and we were, I stopped and got her an ice cream. We were having ice cream. And she said, I like ice cream more than you do. So I tried to explain to her, I said, honey, you can't say that. How You'd have to know how much I know in order to, yeah. you know, you're trying to explain to a five-year-old. Yes. Uh, uh, how she, this none doesn't make any sense. And she just said, she just keeps eating her ice cream. And, yes. Uh, like, <laughs> we're back at the table, me going, well, belonging is more important than, <laughs> than and, knowing. And, and that's why I think whenever we're uh, in the presence of someone and meet them where they are, it helps us. It just helps us so much Can I, when yes. we join them where they are and walk with them. Can I? It touches us. Let's talk a little bit about that because I told you I'm studying A Course in Miracles. We talk about that briefly. And one of the things I love about it, because I need this, is it reminds us that our salvation is together. It's it's right. in the other. I, I, I'm like the Merton thing I told you off, Mike, that I don't know if I'm a contemplative or if I'm just an introvert. And there's something about, there's a line in the course that says, you can't know your own perfection until you see the perfection in everyone who was made like you. And I was, and, and there's also like Richard Rohr says, I don't know of a personal salvation. That's a true salvation. That's just you. Like I, that's not, that's not how it works. Right. It's an everybody thing. Can you talk about our salvation hiding in, in one another? It, it, yeah, I say so. I have to do that. Yeah. Merton, I love this quote in Merton. He was lying in the middle of the night and uh, he had insomnia. And uh, he's lying there in the dark. He says, suddenly the bed becomes an altar and in a distant city somewhere, someone is suddenly able to pray. And then he says, perhaps the people who, perhaps the people whose lives we will touch the most deeply are people we will not meet until after we are dead. Mm. And do you know that Hindu mythic image of Indra's net? Indra's net. Yeah, it's like a, imagine a big fishing net, and each knot of the net is a diamond. Yeah. And each diamond reflects all the other diamonds. Yeah. So we're woven into each. Other. So it's like way if I'm suffering, my suffering doesn't belong to me. My suffering is I'm woven into the suffering of everybody. And we're woven together in our blessedness, and we're woven together in our suffering. Yes. And so we're woven together in the interconnectedness of each other, mm. like the siblings of the infinite. Right. You know? And uh, yeah, community. Right. It's beautiful. I've also heard that's how God is suffering. This is a Richard line, but with us, through us, and as us. Exactly. That's a comforting. It is. When God is sustaining you, when he's beating your mother or beating you when you're a, a little boy, God was a part of that suffering, not a <clears throat> spectator to it. Is that correct? I, I was uh, <clears throat> on this retreat this, uh, recently. And I have this, something that I say poetically. Um, <clears throat> and I say that even if you burn to death, fire is trustworthy. Mm. You know, even if you drown water is trustworthy. <laughs> even if a stranger carries you off to do terrible things, that person's your misguided brother or sister. Wow. And mystically it's true. Right. Because we're beyond the body. It's eternal. Right. And uh, afterwards, uh, someone contacted me and they were very upset when I said that because his daughter and wife burned to death. 
You know, when I said fire is trustworthy, it was a, see, a, a triggering event in trauma is anything that reminds you of the trauma. That's right. Even though in other ways it's completely different, yeah. the autonomic nervous system will re-experience yeah, it. Yeah. You've seen so, my dog bark when I'm in the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, and so, I, so we had a lovely talk yeah. about that. And uh, because the way I put it too is that uh, when someone's in a traumatized state, to speak about their trauma in spiritual terms is deeply disrespectful to that person. Mm. Mm. And they can tell you don't understand them. Mm. And uh, the only authentic response is, I'm so sincerely sorry that you are having to go through this. Mm. See, that they know they're not alone. That's, right. that's the thing, that right. they know they're not alone with it. Well, that's a little bit Napoleon, isn't it? I, I'm not saying they're delusional or, or psychotic, but they're lost in their grief, and it's not helpful for you to go. Yeah, but, but how I put it, too, I put this in the memoir. When Maureen died, for almost a year, I would literally walk around this way screaming out loud, like I loved you so much. I loved you so. Much. I'm not happy. wasn't happy here mm. at all, and uh, just wanted to die really. But then over time, mm. so you could say I was in a delusional, but it was my it wasn't delu It was my life. Right. Okay. So because the intensity and density of the pain can eclipse access to the deeper place, mm. you can't get past it. And then over time, it started to shift for me where I said, you know, it's not that I loved you so much. You're dead and I still love you. Mm. And I believe that you still love me from a depth of love I can barely comprehend. You and I talked about this over and over over the years. I share with people that we would sit out there and have muffin hour on the porch. And I was always be writing with my fountain pen. And, and uh, she would say, I'm going to go in. She'd usually go in first. And we'd have dinner. And... Uh, and I say, I'll be in in 10 minutes. And it was like a little ritual. 20 minutes later, she'd come out. I'd be writing. And she'd look at her wrist, touch her wristwatch, go <laughs> like this. And I'd put the cap on my pen, and she would always come out right when I was the, right at the verge of a deep thought. Yes, yes. And the thought would come to me, the day might come, I would give anything to have you come out and interrupt me at the edge of a deep thought. Mm. And that day has come, because mm. she's dead. Mm. And, uh, mm. and, and so that's the thing, we ride the waves, we're stuck in a certain place, but if we sit with it, the stuck place uh, has a certain uh, un, uh, previously unrecognized openings in it, mm. you know? Mm. And uh, by intimately walking with the hurting place with insight and patience and courage and listening to it, we can find our way back into the light again. And I, and I say too, if we find our way back into the light, not everybody does. But if we do, we know how important it is not to forget what we learned in the dark mm. about suffering. Don't fragility. delete it. Don't delete it. Don't dismiss it. Because that's your trigger. That's your touch point of empathy with those who are lost in the dark. What a gift you are uh, exactly, to those who exactly, have lost exactly. partners, yeah, right? Exactly. And I, I think of that all the time. I go, what use am I? If I do something I don't like, um, it's usually something small, but I, I, I lose some battle of will and I do the easy thing or the, the whatever. Sometimes I comfort myself and I go, what use am I if I don't, if I can't relate <laughs> to someone who yeah. occasionally eats too much fried chicken or whatever it might have been? What use am I if yeah. I'm just over here, I don't even touch the ground? There was this nun I used to see in therapy and uh, she had this thing about nuns aren't supposed to smoke. Yes. <clears throat> and she had anxiety disorder actually. And then, so she smoked in her room. She, she put towels under the door open up the window and she'd take a deep drag and blood like this. And she felt really bad that she smoked. She yeah. was in therapy wanting to. Uh, yeah. And I said, well, it's, it would be good if you could, wouldn't smoke because it's not good for your health. But I have another suggestion. Uh, next time you're leaning toward the window, take a very deep drag and blow it out the window as incense to the divine mercy that's infinitely in love with you as you smoke your cigarette. Right. And the smoke will go better. Yeah. She liked that. That's like, that reminds me of Father Boyle. I think of him all the time. He goes, I don't believe God has a plan for you, meaning the plan would be quit smoking. I believe God is too busy delighting in you to have a plan for you. Yeah, uh, that's very true. Isn't that good? That's true. And yeah. like you're, it just, you hear it, you go, yes. You know, another way I put it too is um, uh, sometimes when there is something going on, we know it's not good for us. Like, physical thing with thing or sexuality or alcohol, whatever it is, is we're compromising our wholeness and we can't stop. Yeah. Is that there is a stance of active waiting. 
So active waiting isn't indifference or passivity. I'll just keep doing it. I don't care. Mm. But you wait in a willingness to do it when the grace to given you to do it, you'll do it. Mm. And it's not there yet. And the fact it's not there yet, I can learn not to do violence or the fragility of my waiting. Mm. Because God isn't waiting for me to do it before God starts loving me. Mm. God's infinitely in love with me and my inability to stop doing it. Mm. That's why I share with people in the Merton Talks, imagine your issue in life is a temper. And you're always working on your temper. And your last act on this earth in the hospital is you throw a bedpan and then you die. <laughs> I say this is regrettable <laughs> because when you could have hit somebody and you're hoping for a better exit. But what really matters most is you threw it knowing God's infinitely in love with people who don't throw bedpans. God's infinitely in love with people who do. Yeah. And if you throw it that way. Yes. Uh, and exhale the incense. Yeah, yeah. Flannery O'Connor says she had this vision of at the end of time of all the all the the fools of the world leading humanity into the gates of paradise. Mm. Uh, and the fools of the world are jumping up and down, turning somersaults and so on, followed by the righteous concerned whether or not they're singing on key. <laughs> <laughs> the same idea. Well, that goes back to the breath we were saying. The, the ego would rather scan the breath and wand it down. And, yeah. and, and we don't want, we don't, our, our, mm. we don't want, I tried to do this joke on stage. I go, my God is love, which is boring. It's so boring. It's like a friend who doesn't talk shit. Mm -hmm. I go out to him at a bar. Of course, I'm joking, but I'm like, ah, did you see what Andy did? And he's like, Andy is my beloved. He's mm -hmm. my treasure. Yeah. He's my treasure. And I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> you know, like you mm -hmm. kind of, if you're being really honest, if I'm being really honest, I'll leave you out of it. I can catch myself wanting that old school God that goes with us, not with us. Mm -hmm. That's every sport game, sport game. That's every athletic event. That's every Oscar night. We want winners and losers. Yeah, and and that's strife, like the political scene today. Exactly, the political scene today. And we, we, so somehow there are all the, there are those who are. It's like, sometimes I put it this way: Do you want to live in the truth? Then believe what I believe. We can sing a hymn of praise to God together. But if you differ from me this much or this much in error, differ from me this much or this much, completely disagree with me, you're completely in error, and may God have mercy on your soul, and God won't, because this was your chance that's it, that's to know right. the truth. I gave it to you. And yes. they like that. They don't, they, there's people who really um, yeah. walk around like that. There's a line, I just read it in A Course in Miracles, where it says, even when your brother is wrong, tell him he's right. Because if you're if you're judging and labeling what he's saying, you're from your ego as well. But l look past that and see the true self. Like rec what you recognize yeah. in him, you'll recognize in yourself. Yeah. I see, I want to see two layers of that. Yeah. You know, in Rogerian therapy, they, they, they talk about um, self-congruence. And so the, the Rogerian triad, Carl Rogers client-centered therapy is unconditional positive regard. No matter what you tell me, it won't l l lessen my respect for you. Mm. The, the next is uh, empathy. I can join you. I hear you saying you're not alone. And the third one is self-congruence. I'll always be honest with you. Mm. And so you would say something, but it's always in a respectful way. Like quite honestly, when you talk like that, I'm concerned about you. Mm. That has respect in it. Mm. And that's very different than shooting from the hip and correcting the person. Right. It's completely different. It's interesting. But we can't, we love doing that. I mean, I, we I love, do. yeah. Somebody, well. Rain Wilson did the podcast. I, I actually liked it, but I said tenants instead of tenants. And he corrected me. And I thought about it later and I was like, isn't it interesting how vulnerable, how, how fragile we are? You know, I think about I, humor. I tell me, tell me what you think about this too. Tell me. Uh, so much of humor. And I think, I, I think there's a kindness to your humor. Oh, as as this, Mike Berbiglia keeps calling me like he's on, I shouldn't say who is fire. it. Who is it? Another comedian. Oh, oh. See, only my friends know my phone's always on Do Not Disturb, so they call me twice, <laughs> and then I think it's my wife. I think there's some some yeah, issue. They know how to do that. Yeah, it's annoying. Uh, I'm oh, so sorry. Tell me about. Uh, no, yeah, Bob, come here. I listen to your comedy, and there's a there's, there's a kindness to it. It's funny. <laughs> some touch. comedians, uh, like Norm Macdonald, I thought he was brilliant. Yeah, but dark. Yeah, 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 for sure. So dark. Yeah. And what is it about meanness that makes us laugh? I know. You say the meanest thing. There's something, there's almost like a release to feel laugh about it. Yes. To lessen the discomfort we have it. But it's still done in such a way there's an edge to it. Like you really wonder. Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of thoughts about this. I, I say on the show all the time, 
even the even take your pick, Thomas Merton, some holy person, occasionally got on the train and was like, I don't know why, but I hate the back of this guy's head. Mm. It just flashes through you. I, I hate this guy's head. <laughs> and when a comedian who's in a status position, he's under lights, so his mask is presumably off, he's lit, he's loud, he's in an alpha position, and he uses his alphaness to lower himself and tell you about his shortcomings, even if it's in ugliness, because we have a social contract to not be ugly. And he goes, that's what it's like up here. One time... I was That's true. I was stoned and I don't do a lot of drugs. I, I don't I don't I have this piety alarm go off. That's so silly. <laughs> Forgive me for that. But I was stoned. This was years ago, and I was like, oh my God, stand-up comedy is is accurately and honestly reporting what it feels like to be floating around oh, in this madness. Oh, true. So when I say I used to have a joke where I go, I hate my girlfriend's friends. I just hate them. I already have a I have a girl. What do I need these these women telling me these stories? And I would and I'd go, get out of here, Bridget. I, I'm full up. Like I'm good. And yeah. I talk about I hate my girlfriend's parents. I don't I can't do this joke. I couldn't even post it on my Instagram because my in-laws follow me now. But there was an honesty to the shallowness of it. The, the, or or whatever. No, that's you want. true. No, that's good. No, that's really true. Right. And then we laugh at our shallowness. That's right. Because it yeah. It's it's yeah. a way of it's shadow work. It's yeah. like it's okay, and yeah. and you can tell that I love myself even despite this. Maybe not Norm. I don't know. Some guys aren't going the self love route, but I'm going like join me in celebrating how absurd this is. No, that's really true. I hope. Years ago, I saw a card. I used to get New Yorker magazine all the time. Cartoon, sure. And it was husband and wife talking, and she's trying to cheer him up. You can tell he's down, like feeling. And she's to cheer him up. She says, "Sweetheart, listen." <laughs> She said, of course you're going to feel like a failure if you keep comparing yourself to men who are successful. <laughs> <laughs> you feel worse. Yes, that's great. <laughs> so you laugh because... It's great. Yeah. It, well, comedy is, this is not my theory, but somebody did a very expensive thing. It's a benign violation. So a wife isn't supposed to say that, but it's not, she's not cutting his head off with shears. That's too far. That's true. It has I, to be I, benign. I think it's really true. Yeah. So I'm not supposed to say I hate my girlfriend's parents. Yeah. That's benign, though, because they're not here. That's why comedy gets very different when there's a person in the wheelchair in the front row. That's right. Everything changes. It does. And that's what happened with social media. I make a joke like that, and I just said I can't share it because my in-laws will see it. So comedy got, came out of the clubs, and now all the stuff that's supposed to be taboo, or it's like a little, like, oh, we're in a nightclub in Amsterdam, and we're just kind of being naughty, and isn't it wicked? And it's fun, or performance arty. It changes when that same joke scrolls through your feed at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday and you're in your office. That's true. That's <laughs> Context true. is gone. That's true. <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts about this. Yeah, that is true. Well, boy, I've, I'm so enjoying this conversation. I don't want it to end. And you've, you've, uh, you've given us so much. I, I just want to make sure I don't forget anything I absolutely wanted to ask you. Oh, this is what I wanted to get. This, is, this will be a nice way to close. When we were talking about God earlier, I started asking you this. I was worried that some people might back away because they start going old man in the sky. Most people that listen to this podcast know we don't mean that. Um, or if that, or if we do that, that that's a metaphor. When you say God, just to include people, what are we talking about? What are the definitions or, or the images or the quotes or whatever it may be? that isn't just the, the arbiter of who goes to hell and heaven, all the classic stuff that just rightfully turns so many people away from, they, they'd rather skim on the surface if going under means there's a tormentor down there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I guess I would say that uh, for me, my understanding of God is uh, the God that's revealed in a contemplative understanding of the scriptures and also in the philosophical theology of, uh, uh, of uh, the Christian tradition, Duns Scotus, Thomas Aquinas, and Merton, the mystics. And so I'm looking at it in that, but there, there would be analogous parallels in Taoism, in, in uh, the path of yoga, namaste, in the path of, of, the, of the Buddha, uh, the divinity, the phenomenal world, boundless in all directions, and so on. Mm. So I, I would say that in the word God, is a word that we use for the infinity of presence. That there's a, there's a the beginningless, endless, boundaryless, in infinity of presence itself. Mm, being itself. 
Yeah, you, another word for it, sat it could be being also. Yeah. And say this, and then ultimately speaking, just one thing is happening, that this infinite presence is presencing itself, mm. that it's pouring itself out and endlessly giving itself away in and as the gift and the miracle of the intimate immediacy of your very presence, mm. the presence of others and the presence of all things in our communal nothingness without God. So God is like a poetic sound, like a word for that generosity. And then I say, when it comes to you, so that's true of stones and trees and stars and the world is God's body. It is bodying forth this love that's uttering it into being. So when God created you as a person, um, God creates us as persons, unlike stones and trees and stars, God creates you would, that when God created the here's there's a before creation, there's no capacity for love in God, because God is octus plurissimus, the overflowing fullness of love itself. So if you have a glass of water and you pour water in it, the water's overflowing. There's no capacity for water in the cup, so there's no capacity for love in God. Therefore, God creates the capacity to receive the infinite love of God. And God creates a kapox dei, and that's you. Mm. God creates the capacity. The overflow. For the, the overflow. Because God, and so God creates you as the beloved, as the one to whom God can completely, infinitely give the infinity. So that's what I say, the, the generosity to the infinite is infinite, and we are the generosity of God. And that's what I mean by, that's my sense of, God. And then when we fall and stumble, then I know the acceptance of my fragility, that when love touches suffering, the suffering turns love into mercy. And uh, so to me, that's, that's mm. God. Am I, and I, that's, that's yeah. my understanding. And your experience, I have to imagine. That's my experience. When you spelunk in, you find a lover, not a tormentor. Yeah, yeah. In other words, I, <clears throat> another thing I think is so important is that if we're talking about the topic, God, that's one thing. You know, do you, is there this being called God and you think that's true or not? Let's argue about it. Mm. But I think in reality, it's not a topic. It's a word that you use to express something you've tasted mm. see, that you can't explain. It's innermost and it matters very much. Mm. And then how can you walk by it and, and live by it and share it? And that's how Jesus, that's Jesus, that's the Buddha, that's Muhammad on the night of destiny. To become it. You become it. To recognize, it. I've heard God doesn't love us. We are God's love. We are God's love. Right. In our nothingness, that's the paradox. We are God's love in our nothingness without God. And uh, it's, that unit of, it's that unit of experience. And then we're to see it shining out through the details, like it gives itself silently in prayer, but it gives itself in the, in the unfolding of the day, mm. you know, like the endless variations of this ultimate unfolding. And we can learn to experience it, breathe it, walk by it, and live it, and the contemplative way of life. Mm. And when you were yelling in this apartment, sitting, I heard you say you sat with your pain, you listened yeah. to it. It sounds like you gave it space, you let it express itself. I'm wondering how you inched yourself back. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I would say first mystically, I would say, this, in the language of the cross, God's, God was the infinity of my pain. God was the infinity of my pain because the mystery of this love, God so loved the world, that God became our pain to be one. That's God's response to us in our dilemma is to be identified with us as precious in, in our dilemma. Mm. And so God's, God was the infinity of my pain, mm. sustaining me unexplainably when I couldn't find anywhere to hold on to mm. like that. That's what I... It that's, came to you as pain? It was, yes. Yeah, it, it was came, pain. It was pain. And at one level, it was just pain. What I mean is, I was I was in a traumatized state actually, yeah. because it re-triggered my childhood trauma, yeah. and it all came like that. Mm. But then I I believe that as I because uh, it's how I lived my whole life. Uh, that's what I mean by spirits just from nothing, even as we're sustained in all things. Mm. And uh, then little by little by little, I emerged into a more grounded place. That's not it, that's not dualistically other than the pain itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's all interwoven. And like was that. there action there? Was it friends? Was it... Well, I think for me it was... Part of it, I just sorted it out myself. Mm. But also, uh, my two I'm too, very close to my two daughters. And uh, they came to visit me regularly. They see me every weekend, and I'm close to both of them. 
And um, I really sensed in their love for me, it's like life goes on, mm. life goes on. And, uh, uh, and I, I need to move on. And I, I, and I know of Maureen, if I died first, uh, it would have been the same with Maureen. I think she would have been lost and bereft, mm. but she knows that life, life goes on, you know. And I also think for myself, you know, I'm 80 years old, May 30th. I'm not stuck here forever, you know. Right, right. <laughs> so I'll disappear soon enough. Yeah. Too. And so I just, uh, it was so big for me because I'm a trauma therapist. Yes. And I, I've known trauma. I know what trauma is. So I knew what was happening. And also my therapy helped me just know how to work with my trauma mm. and how to integrate it and contextualize Mentally, it. Mentally, internally? Yeah, I could within myself. Mm. I could see what I was doing. Tell me a little bit about death, just to close, feels appropriate. Here we are at the end, talk about death. Because I, I, I don't feel that fear or that panic vanishing or going home. Uh, again, R Ramana Maharshi keeps coming up. When he was dying, he said, don't be silly, where could I go? I heard you say the same thing right. about Maureen. Um, as best as we can, just with no stakes or judgment, what do you, what do you make of death? Oh, here's my yes. My sense is this, is that, and I, I put it in the book because I, I, when she was dying, I said this too, because we used to talk about it. Yeah. When I was in the monastery, uh, an old lay brother died, and Merton was talking to the novices about death. He said, it's very helpful to know that when we die, we don't go anywhere when we die. We don't orbit the earth a few times and take off and go to God. Mm. If scripture says, in God we live and move and have our being, we're living our life in the vast interiority of God. All the dead are here, all the angels are here. All the... Mm. And we don't see the dead for the same reason we don't see God. <clears throat> but in deep meditative state, you can see the dead, meaning realize the oneness, the ancestors, mm. the oneness. So, I, I, so what I think then death is, uh, how I put it is that uh, when we're born onto the earthly plane, how I put it poetically, God exhales the infinity of herself as us in our life. And we're on this earth through time for a very short time, basically to learn how to love, basically. And in God's good time, God inhales and we return back home to this love. Mm. St. Mictel, the mystic said that God revealed to her that he has so freely chosen to be so hopelessly in love with her, mm. that he honestly doesn't know if he could handle being God without her. And she says, take me home with you. I'll be your physician forever. <laughs> and so what I think mystical death is, on this earth, we die to everything less than love and having the authority to name who we are. Mm. See? And if we, that wall, we can do that to such a refinement that in some deep sense when we die, nothing will happen mm. because we've already died. Mm. Like, if you die before you die, you won't die when uh, you die. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 so the mystic is in somebody who says, listen to what I've experienced. The mystic says, look what love's done to me. See, there's nobody left. Mm. And when there's nobody left, who dies? Mm. You know, that's a, but, I, but another very real level, I'm going to die. Right. It's very real. Right, right. It's already in the right. mail. It's on its way. That's what my friend David <laughs> Nickturn says. He goes, if it's all one, whose headache is this? Yeah. Which I, I think about that all the time. There's a little quote uh, by Ram Dass. I keep it up here, Maureen. I keep, used to keep her sayings. Yeah. And it says, don't be afraid of death. It's like taking off a tight shoe at the end of the day. Yeah. And Mirabai Star said, Ram Dass said that. Yeah. Because Maureen, I used to listen to Ram Dass all yeah. the time. Yeah. <laughs> Ram Dass, uh, I'm going to dork out here. He's actually quoting Elijah, who was a channeled, disembodied being who said that. Because yeah. he asked the woman yeah. Miss, something Prendergast. I, I'm just dorking out. Uh, what about death? And he said, don't worry, it's like taking off a tight shoe. Uh -huh. <laughs> now uh -huh. you, you can have a little footnote and go, that's that's the deepest way yeah. of that. That's really true. It's so beautiful, though. What it, what it, You have such a way, and I, I'm just, I think everybody's really happy they tuned in for this. I know I am. No, I'm happy you came. Uh, that's lovely. great. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, this is our last question, only because it's fun, hopefully for you. Can you tell me a time in your life when you laughed really, really hard, and it doesn't have to be a great story, but if you're crying with tears, often in a situation when you're not supposed to laugh, often somebody fell down, sometimes somebody farted. These are the prompts. <laughs> I'll show you a story that would represent moments where I've, get it, that I can't think of an actual thing where I've laughed like that. I, yeah. <clears throat> the story that I tell is, uh, 
Uh, imagine you're on a big boat going across a vast expanse of water, a lot of people on the boat, the music's playing, everyone's dancing. In a moment of carelessness, <clears throat> you fall off the back of the boat and you're waving frantically and they don't notice the music's playing. And uh, you realize you can't tread water very long, but you can float for a long time. So your strategy is, is you'll float till hopefully they rec realize you're gone, they'll come back looking for you. Now, in order to float, you have to relax or you'll sink. So how would you be relaxing out there? <clears throat> You'd be relaxing very uh, seriously. And let's, say the, and let's say the waves are real big like this, going like this, and all day goes, and it turns into night, all night long, you're looking up at the stars, kind of like the next morning, you see the sun coming up, and suddenly it dawns on you that at some very intimate level, it doesn't matter whether they come back or you drown, it's the same thing. And you, you burst out laughing like uh. that. And just as you're laughing, you look, and out of the corner of your eye, you see the boat coming back to get you. Mm. And when they pull you on board, you're so grateful. And that night in bed, lying there in the dark, you're so grateful they found you, but you know your life was really saved when you were out there in the water mm. and you realized the oneness of birth and death. Wow. You know? And I think that's the laugh. That's, that's the laughter. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to carve you a trophy out of bronze <laughs> and gold plate it, though, because that is the greatest answer to that question of all time. It's, a good, it's, a good, it's, it's true. Too. It's beautiful. Really true. Yeah. There is a, uh, we don't, I'm not even going to, offer my thoughts because that that's just a great way to end okay would you say this is silly uh but richard did it mirabai did it so we had the guests say keep it crispy it's how we say goodbye you say keep it crispy and then the show is over yeah so keep you... it crispy <laughs> <laughs> extra crispy extra crispy thank you so much yeah. what a gift yeah you made it weird. you made it weird.